Hi, it's Derek. How to Hi-Fi is the name of this episode. And for those who know that this podcast is generally about thoughts and feelings about music, I know a lot of people come to me. I get DMs all the time from people asking me, can I get your advice on Hi-Fi? I get friends. Derek, could you tell me about this? <laughs> I'm going to send them this, this episode from now on. So I know that a lot of you guys are asking this. So if you wish to hear more about music and culture, we've got plenty of those episodes, but this one is quite functional, but I think it's also quite, it's going to be quite helpful for a lot of you because a lot of you who listen to this don't know about this space and wish to get into it and, and trust me to be able to introduce you to this world. If you've just found me in podcast or in video form, my name's Derek. I talk about music and hi-fi on the internet in a way that maybe is suited to your taste, which is like not too technical, not too snobby and all that. Before I get started, what's going on in my world? Wifey just picked up this uh, Ricardo Bofil book about his incredible house that uh, was produced by Apartmento that I want to look up later. It looks like such a beautiful, beautiful book. I'm also uh, talking with people on the Discord about the Anthony Fantano a lawsuit that is happening right now where it's like whether using a sound of his is fair use when Activision uses it and who put it in which category of commercial rights and uses. All very interesting topics that, you know, we are all interested in if you listen to this podcast, but just filling you in about what's going on in my world at the moment, books to read, lawsuits to dissect, but we are here to dissect hi-fi. Now, who is this for? This is for primarily and predominantly people that want to play their records. People that have bought a record would like to start a journey of owning records and collecting records, but are overwhelmed by all of the information, all of the technical things, all of the brands that you need to learn, the language you need to learn, and don't have an entry point into this world. Now, I promised making this podcast months and months ago. I never did it because I ended up thinking, I want to write this all down and make it into a zine, which I still will do at some point. But alas, I haven't gotten around to it yet. And I feel a bit responsible for the questions that people ask me. So the common questions I get asked, I got a record and I need a record player. What do you recommend? What brands are good? What is good? What is bad? What do I need to look for? What is the best whatever I can get for my money? Can you recommend speakers? Can you recommend? Does it matter about this and that? It's a lot to unpack. Now, I'm going to break it down into different phases and tiers with an analogy that I have just in a second. But the first thing I want to address with you, lovely people, is audio files. The term that I can sometimes be referred to as, uh, which is a bummer, <laughs> but I understand but I would say whatever you do, like anything, do not worry about what other people think of your setup. There are lots of horrible people in the world that will judge what you do and how you do it. I was going to say especially in this world, but I think in most industries, with whether you're into cars or baking, someone will tell you you shouldn't use this instrument, you should use that, cameras, who cares? I think personally, if you are happy with your setup and it's within your budget, then I'm happy for you because you can spend infinite amounts on hi-fi and not everyone is as picky and not everyone is as interested in spending a lot of time, energy to f build a, a, a sound system. So just be aware that there is no such thing as best. There is just what suits your personality. I know a lot of people with very simple setups that are very happy and that may be you. I know people with setups that are really extreme, that are endlessly dissatisfied <laughs> because they're just trying to chase the next thing to make it even better than the last. So this is the analogy that I'm going to break it down into. I think hi-fi and the uh, pursuit of it or the hobby of it is very much similar to owning a car. There's three types of categories of car owners, I think. There is, 
either owning your first car or someone that doesn't care about cars. They want a car that can get them from A to B. It does the job. I don't care what it looks like. You know, I'm sure these types of people generally like good fuel economy, but they don't care about how much horsepower. They don't care about, you know, all the, the modern conveniences. They just care about getting from A to B. The second person is a person that might have a bit more budget, wants to identify more with the products that they own. They want to spend more on the mod cons. They want to spend more on something that might represent who they are as a person and represent their lifestyle. So there's more input into how they look, how they might be built, you know, where they come from, the kind of the the characteristics of the sound. That is the next person. So you're looking at from a car perspective, you might be like, I want leather this time around. I want a, you know, a stronger engine so when I'm driving on the highway. I want, you know, I my first car had really bad air conditioning. So that is a, a must that has to have really strong air conditioning, the next one type thing. You know, I want it in this particular color and this brand does these colors really well. So I like that. So that's the second person. The third is the person that's basically an enthusiast that is either someone that's into like JDM cars that tinkers away all the time for a budget or they're buying supercars and you're buying the the biggest engine with the most horsepower and the most supercharged turbocharged type car that you might you might be a person that takes it to the races and and actually takes it onto track or you're a person that has a Ferrari that drives around the suburbs you know it's a it's a person that has a lot of money and a lot of time to care about these features and as much you're interested in the beauty of it and the output like I would love a lovely Porsche right but and I would nerd out on all the things it can do but I wouldn't be actually using those features let's be real I'm not drag racing if I was to buy a Porsche one day I wouldn't be taking it to the track but I like the idea that it's so well engineered and can go really fast, you know? A bit absurd. And can, that's where the snobbiness really, really comes from. Taking a brief break from the podcast to introduce you the other sponsor, which is myself and my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash G underscore Derek. I launched it a few weeks ago to basically supercharge what I give to you guys as entertainment, whether that is the newly launched radio show that is exclusive to Patreon that I'm putting out every week. There's podcast mini-sodes as well as a whole raft of other perks that Patreon is a way to support creators. And in turn, I can provide you guys with some music discovery every single week. So please, I'd love you to check it out. Thank you for everyone that has become a patron so far. It's really been a, a really, really lovely experience. Now back to the pod. All right, so the first person is the first car person. The A to B. I don't care too much. I just want to play my records. And I think that's a nice place to be. The person probably has a modest budget, which is anywhere between a hundred bucks and getting close to a thousand dollars. But even that for a lot of people is a lot of money because it's hi-fi when you're speaking about all the other priorities that you might have in life and thinking, I don't want to spend a grand on that. Then this is the place for you. You don't have a huge budget. You don't want to research too hard. You just want something that reliably works. Now, this goes against the grain for a lot of people. I'm going to talk about record players here because this actually breaks my brain a little bit because I come from a different generation. But a lot of people in this category are really, really happy with Bluetooth enabled record players. Now, I say it breaks my brain because I come from a generation of everything analog stays analog. You have wires connected to amplifiers connected to speakers, and that's how you do things. But for a lot of people in this category, I just want to play my records and I just want to see it on a record player playing. I don't care about the rest of it. And a lot of my followers, a lot of people that have spoken to me love their Bluetooth record players. And that's wonderful. That's just how it is these days. That's how people would listen to music. And so everyone has a Bluetooth speaker. And all you need to think about is you get this record player, you pair it with your Bluetooth speaker, and then you put your record on and it plays. You don't have to think about wires. You don't, the only wire you have to think about is the one to plug in the record player. And then you connect it to your speaker and you're away and you're happy. So 
I think for a lot of people that just want to play their records and aren't too fussy, just do that. It's fine. It's fine. It's not complicated. It's easy. It gets you into the world. And maybe you play your record once every six months anyway. So why bother with anything else? And I think that that is a nice entry point and a nice uh, 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 accessible, cheap way to get into things because you can get Bluetooth enabled record players for a couple hundred bucks and you are done because you already have your speaker. Now, if you don't want to go down that route, then let me talk you through a few things you should look for in a turntable. You should be looking for a turntable. There's, there's different types. There's belt driven and there's direct drive. One is a belt that goes around the platter, they call it, the disc that spins and, and drives a belt. One is direct drive where there's no belt, there's a motor underneath the platter and it spins it like that. Different types, different strokes. Usually a direct drive is more for DJing purposes than anything else. I have a belt driven one. I think that it is important to think about having not too much technological componentry within your turntable on off <laughs> start stop you can play 45 rpm records on it you can play 33 and a third records on it as well but when you have things like it's an automatic player where you press a button and the arm lifts up and then lowers down onto the record i don't love that type of stuff my first record player did have that granted and i paid less than 100 dollars for it but I just think there's more mechanical parts, more to go wrong. And you're kind of paying for that feature when you could just lift up the tone arm and put it onto the record. So I just, I'm not a fan of those types of things, even though they're a bit of a novel exercise to press a button and see something move almost like magic. I think you should also consider that your record player has a removable stylus. Stylus is the needle. It's nice to be able to remove it because when that needle, as they all degrade these diamond tipped cartridges you can pull it out buy a new one and it will be just as good as when you bought it type thing whereas there are some really cheap record players that just have the stylus built into the tone arm and then once that's dead then you have to like what replace the whole tone arm you wouldn't bother you just buy a new record player so those are little things to consider now when you're a beginner you also have to think about the other components but i think that for the very, very, I want an A to B, just go with the Bluetooth and be simple. And let's go on to the next category because then I can talk more about the componentry of things. So the, the next one, which could bleed into the first one as well, is the person that wants to express themselves through their hi-fi a little bit, through their aesthetic, maybe through the sound, maybe they wanna spend a little bit more money. I would prepare yourself to spend around a thousand bucks or more. You can do less. You can buy off Craigslist, Gumtree, wherever you are in the world. You can buy hi-fi systems for cheap. You could probably buy speakers and an amplifier and a record player for 200 bucks if you're lucky. But I think that if you want to buy components that you think are relatively good, then you should be budgeting for around there. One other bit of advice is like stick to your budget. You can always upgrade components as well. So just stick to your budget. If you buy a Bluetooth record player, you can still plug, I guarantee you can still plug that in this one amplifier later. So just stick to your budget. Now I'm going to go over brands in a second as well. So if you want to express yourself a little bit, explore hi-fi a little more, you don't want to go so, so simple as having a Bluetooth record player and you want to go a bit more elevated. You've got to understand a few things. You have to understand that you need a record player that plugs in to an amplifier, an integrated amplifier, as they call them. And then you plug that, you put some speaker cables into the back of that and plug that into speakers. Now, the record player itself, when the stylus hits the record, the actual signal that comes out of that is really, really quiet. And in some way, and I've spoken about this a lot, and somewhere in this signal, you need to have what's called a pre-amplifier or a phono stage, same thing, that amplifies this signal before going to the speakers. Now, usually your integrated amplifier has that. You should be looking for a it saying phono on there because that's where you plug in your record player into it and your amplifier amplifies this signal and then sends it to the speakers, right? But sometimes those amplifiers don't have it. Sometimes the record players have it. Some record players say preamp built in, which means that you could kind of have 
you could plug your record player into something that has an aux input because there's a preamplifier built into your turntable. So say you have speakers that have an auxiliary in, then or like powered speakers as they call them, then you can plug them in and then you can listen to your records. Powered speakers and passive speakers are two different types. Passive speakers, there's no electricity that you don't plug it into power at all. You just have a copper wire in them. A powered speaker you plug into the wall and usually like take a Sonos. A Sonos is essentially a powered speaker because you plug it into power, connects to the internet, it connects it, you know, you've got ethernet at the back, you've got all these different, it's got an amplifier built into it. It's got everything in one box. That's a powered speaker. It's got everything that you need in one place. Now, so you have your record player with a removable cartridge that doesn't have too much going on in terms of like automatic and all that sort of stuff. Then you plug it into an amplifier. Now amplifiers, there's different wattages, there's different, it can be quite overwhelming as to like how much, how many watts it outputs. And it's quite, it's quite a lot. And I would say, firstly, let's address integrated amplifier. Because back in the day, they used to be, you buy these things separate. You have the power amplifier and you have the preamplifier and you have, and these are separate devices, separate modules that you plug in. One preamplifies it and you plug all your inputs into your record player, your radio, your CD player. And then one's the power amplifier that's just used for power to power everything else. Very complicated. In the 60s or something, integrated amplifiers started to come about where it was all in one box. And so that's what you're looking for. So you're looking for something that you can plug into the back of an auxiliary CD player, phono for your turntable. And my recommendation for anyone when looking for these is to go for vintage 70s, 80s, Japanese vintage integrated amplifiers because they're built like tanks, they last forever, they look pretty and they're relatively cheap still and they're kind of everywhere. Now you can also buy integrated amplifiers for relatively cheap uh, in terms of brands and I should go over some brands generally, Kenwood, Morant, Sensui, Yamaha, NAD, there's newer brands like Cambridge Audio, Shit, yes that's a brand, Shit, Emotiva, there's many, many uh, budget friendly amplifier, new amplifier brands out there. Personally, I like vintage because I just like how they look and they're kind of in keeping with my kind of style as well. In terms of turntables, you can look at brands like Audio Technica, Project, Fluence, U-Turn. There's so many different ones. They kind of all look somewhat similar. Someone might say, what's the difference between them all? The material is going to be different. The company might not have been around for as long. They might come with different cartridges, which cost a different amount of money. Some of them have a bit more of a stable tone arm than others. Some of them are more budget friendly about like how much bang for your buck you can get. A lot of people talk about Fluence being a really great turntable company to, to invest in because it's a great bang for your buck. Now, when you think about all these wattages and how much power you need to output for your speakers, it's really, really, really complicated for a beginner. And I'll tell you a personal story. When I bought my Klipsch La Scala's, my speakers that are the size of dishwashers, when I bought them off Gumtree for a deal, I thought, I'm just going to buy these because they don't come up very often. But I'm really worried that my amplifier won't be able to power them because I don't know. I don't know how much power they need. And then I plugged it in and it worked. And then when I started learning about hi-fi, I learned that these speakers don't need much power to drive because they have a particular technology, if you will. They're horn spe loaded speakers that don't actually need a huge amount of power to project the amount of sound that it creates. So it turns out my underpowered amplifier was perfectly fine for this scenario. Now I'm gonna generalize and say that whatever speakers that you buy, in the realms of $1,000 and whatever amp that you buy will be fine. It's not going to blow it up. It it modulates that output depending on what the speaker is. The only time where you need a whole lot of wattage is when you have really, really big speakers that, and I, I'm sure my clips is a bad example, but like really, really big, powerful speakers that they say need a lot to drive it. Now, how do you know? When that is the case, you need to ask someone, I would say, like if you're just buying regular regular speakers from brands like 
I'm going to give a listener Klipsch, Kef, Wharfdale, Elac, Polk, JBL, KLH. There's some brands that you should look into. These brands all require an amplifier. Most of these will work with any amplifier. Say in Kef's instance, Kef has these speakers called LSX and they do need a decent amplifier to power them. Say in Klipsch cases, they could probably be powered by most things. So it is one of those things where that can get murky, where it can be quite intimidating because how do I know which goes with that? And like I said, for most cases, you'll buy a vintage amp and some speakers for a few hundred dollars. You'll plug it in and it'll be fine. So don't overthink it. As soon as you're spending too much, not too much, but a lot of money on things and you can tell that they're expensive and you can tell that they're a bit more custom, you'll know that you need to find out how much wattage minimum you need. You can you can kind of Google it in many senses. I know there's a lot of hesitation or fear around speaker cables or wire. And firstly, if you're a real beginner being electrocuted, I know my wife worries about that. I would say make sure when you, there's tutorials online, all it is is a bit of copper. I would recommend getting like a wire cutter and like stripper thing so you can take the little plastic off the edge of it because you know I didn't own one until very, uh, very recently in my life and it kind of changes everything. But I, would, I wouldn't I would worry about that. If you're just plugging it into speakers, just make sure everything's turned off and unplugged and that you are just winding the little copper and putting it, red goes to red, black goes to black or, or white. That's all you need to think about. You're not going to be electrocuted by it. Just make sure nothing's plugged in and you don't, you don't lick it or anything. <laughs> but it's, it's very basic old technology and I did it when I was 13 years old. So you'll be totally fine in that case. The last thing to consider when you are buying these speakers is a streamer because I like to be able to play Apple Music, Spotify, Tidal, whatever on my sound system as well. So a streamer is something that you would plug into your auxiliary on the back of your integrated amplifier, the auxiliary port. And then you can open up your Spotify app and it says here like family room and you click that and it'll play through your amplifier. Basically that box connects to the internet. Some integrated amplifiers have that box inbuilt into their system, but that's more newer and gets more expensive. You can buy very cheap streamers. I recommend one by a company called WIM, W-I-I-M. You can get Raspberry Pi ones. Don't bother with that. It's too complicated. Just get something like the Wim one. You can spend a thousand dollars for one called Blue Sound, the Blue Sound Node, which is like an amplifier and streamer all built in to one. So something to think about. I like my conveniences of being able to use my stereo for absolutely every purpose that I want to listen to music, not just for playing records and CDs. So that is something that I highly recommend you add to your hi-fi system because you're just going to use it more, I guarantee you. When we talk about 70s and 80s as well, I would avoid any 7.1 surround sound system that was from the 90s or 2000s. You're looking, if you're looking for what, how I like to listen to music, you're looking for a two channel or 2.1 channel system, which is two speakers. Point one is the the subwoofer, which depending on your speakers might need a subwoofer as part of it, but not all amplifiers have a subwoofer output. And my old Kenwood didn't have a subwoofer output and I was very happy with it, but all getting a 90s, 2000s amplifier with 7.1, they're different. They're more complicated. They've got more going on and you're not looking for that type of amplification and that type of output. That's for if you want to watch a whole bunch of movies and surround sound. So I wouldn't go there on my first go around. Now, when considering different speakers and, oh, Derek, there's so many different speakers to choose from, so many different brands. How do I know which one's right for me? Again, go listen to some. Go listen to some. You can look at them. Kef speakers look really nice. Clips look really vintage. Maybe you just know. But lots of bars around town have different speakers that you can listen to, or you can go to these stores, which can be a bit stuffy and, and snobby. Bars that have them help because you can kind of go, yeah, this is my vibe. This is how I feel it. And don't overthink it because there's always better in some sense, because even my Scalas, I love them. And I know that there's better in a sense that it presents probably a, you know, a clearer sound, but I'm not I'm not about that life to try to, to go down that rabbit hole. Interrupting this podcast with a very timely sponsor, the enduring sponsor of the pod, which is Turntable Lab. We're talking everything hi-fi. So, hey, works out for everyone, right? Turntable Lab is the trusted source for audio gear for enthusiasts and beginners alike. 
And go there to check out whether you go to turntablelab.com or turntablelab.com forward slash Derek to see my selections and recommendations for beginner gear to get you into the space. But that is the place to go for everything you could possibly need for hi-fi. They also have a record store called The Lab where they have 100,000 records or something insane. So you can also pick up your records there on your way out the door. And there's this deal called the four or more deal where you can take 10% off when you buy four or more records. It's got everything you need, guys. So you listen to this podcast, you're learning a lot. You're on a one-stop shop to get all you need. TurntableLab.com is the place to go. And the final entry is the enthusiast, the high end, the supercar owner, the person that wants to turn it more into a hobby or someone that wants to kind of spend a decent amount of money on audio. And that's cool. And I, I support you in that. And I would definitely consider what I have is to be somewhat high end. And I would say, first and foremost, I built this over time. If you go back to one of my early podcasts about my audio journey or or that hi-fi is more of a luxury than anything. And I talked about how I acquired my speakers. It's over time. And I, I wouldn't recommend you start there because, you know, it's it's unnecessary. But if you are there, then, you know, these types of budgets are kind of, you can create quite a nice high-end setup from $1,000 for them. Really, it's like five grand or more. And what that is, is really breaking down the components to the most uh, extreme, the most high end, the most nuanced in many ways. And it is the pursuit for marginal gains in sound experience and how sound can be presented in different ways to your ears, because there's no such thing, like I said, as perfect or the best. It's more like you're interested in how you can listen to your music in ways that you might not have experienced anywhere else. And so, for example, when we talk about speakers, we are talking about Klipsch horns, which are giant speakers as tall as me that sit in corners that project, bounce it off the walls and project it out to the room and fill the room with sounds. Brilliant Corners, one of my favorite bars, has those speakers. And uh, Paradise Garage or The Loft, The Loft had those speakers and a very like revered club audiophile speakers. But then you might also be looking at, you know, $100,000 Wilson audio speakers, ones that basically you have a chair in the middle of the room and you have these speakers directed at your ears. And I've heard those speakers not that long ago and they are insane. You've never heard sound like that before where it sounds like it's coming from inside your own head, which is kind of a bizarre feeling. It doesn't feel like it's coming from speakers. Now, these types of technologies that takes a lot of research and development to get to that point where they can find the right materials, whether it's titanium, whether it's beryllium, whether it's silk, I don't know. There's all these different types of speaker materials that the manufacturer or, or creator or, or craftsman feels like is the best representation of how to project that sound into your ears. It's a whole rabbit hole for speakers. And then you get into amplifiers and where I said you have integrated amplifiers, you split them all out. So you have power amplifiers, you have preamps. You can have a power amplifier for each speaker. So each speaker is powered by its own power source separately. So you're minimizing interference. Say, if you believe that that's really going to get you anywhere, you look at some of these amplifiers, they are made out of the highest end materials. I don't even know what they're made out of. Like brass or like so they weigh like 70 kilos or something bonkers and at, at most of these at the high end of amplification have tubes vacuum tubes because there's a pursuit at the high end of audio about how you can have the purest sound from the source to your ears with minimal minimal distortion or interference on the way through so less components in order to get you there now Tube amplifiers bring you a warmer sound. That's how they projected and play amplified sound back in the 40s. And so there's this whole community and movement around tube amplification being the best and purest way to listen to music if that's your flavor. But that's so expensive because it's such a niche offering to make because the demand isn't there. Most people listen to things on UE Boom speakers. And then you have turntables where you've got really, really massive turntables that are all about precision, how much vibration there is 
or isn't in these things. You have these plinths that these turntables sit on that absorb all this sound. You have speakers, you have component stands where you can put your amplifier turntable in to absorb all of the vibrations so it can be as still as humanly possible. You have speaker cable that can cost you thousands of dollars that uh, who knows what they're made out of that you can spend a lot of time into. And look, if you have a hundred thousand dollar speakers, get the thousand dollars cables because in some ways it kind of makes sense because it's so expensive. You don't want anything to go wrong. You don't want anything to short out and you, <laughs> you may as well do it. You wouldn't be buying some like $10 speaker cable to power your <laughs> your hundred thousand dollar speakers because that just feels bonkers to me when i've been in those rooms where you've seen these expensive speakers and you see all the expensive kit that goes with setting it up you kind of look at it and go well fair enough if you're spending this much you may as well go the whole hog but at this point you're spending a million dollars on a sound system now you can do it for a lot less obviously so some brands for you ogis my friend devon turnbull makes very simple speakers that are based on speakers from the 30s 40s that aren't technologically innovative but are really well crafted and really well researched but isn't to the grade that some people would consider brands like wilson audio or bowers and wilkins you've got kef which is kind of in the middle very high end but not like on that bespoke custom level of things you have brands like triangle you have brands like tannoy you have brands like macintosh in terms of amps and Marantz and name and and all these there's like super niche manufacturers in japan or wherever that you can get incredible incredible tube amps that i'd love to own but i would say all of this in my personal experience if this is kind of a bit of a hangout where i can just tell you about my personal experiences and give you advice i've listened to a lot of audio at this point and a lot of people ask me how do i get the best how do i get the best for this price and i would say it's so marginal so i was given in exchange for a video Marantz amplifier and CD player. And I upgraded that from my 40 year old Kenwood amplifier that I'd owned for 10 years. And I was really excited because it's like a, my first high end piece of audio tech outside of my speakers, which are very old. And the anticipation was great. And I plugged them in. And I would say that the value in the amplifier comes from more of the technology built within it than the actual sound reproduction. I listened to it and I couldn't tell you like, this is clearly better sounding than my Kenwood, which is wild. I would say that the Ken the Marantz for me, it plugs into my TV. It plugs, it has a streamer built in so I can just open my phone and play and it turns on on its own. You turn on the TV, it turns on the amplifier. You volume up on my TV remote, it volumes up on the amplifier. It plays, it plugs into my CD player. It, it's all integrated, it's all modern, it's all seamless and it's beautiful to look at. And look, I, you can get it for a lot cheaper. I got it for free, but you can get that sort of stuff for a lot cheaper. But that's what I actually value the most out of the Marantz that I own, the 40N, rather than saying to you, yo, I'm so glad I got it because it's just blown my mind and upgraded the sound of my La Scala's by 100%. If anything, it's like a 10% noticeable change, which is barely anything. And I think that it's hard to say with a definite, with any definity that that is a better sounding amplifier, which is interesting. In saying that, like I said, when I listened to the Wilson Audio ones with a million dollar sound system, I could hear how crazy that was and just how no one hears stuff like this except for a very small, wealthy amount of people or people that are given the luxury of going to these sound rooms, listening rooms and listening to these things. So I can, you can tell the differences, but like I said, it's a hobby and a lot of people are pursuing different sounds to kind of get these different experiences. And that's fine. And I think that I can understand having listened to those Wilson Audio ones that when I go back to my La Scala's, I'm like, oh, I would also love a pair of Wilson's because it's a different sound. You know, you, you get bitten by the bug a little bit, but I'm not in any way possible going to own the Wilson audio. So it's just like a, a memory that I have of something really special, but I'm not in any pursuit. I would rather own a home. I'd rather own a, a really nice car before I owned another pair of speakers that make it sound like sound music is coming from my head, you know? So I think it's just a bit of 
a, a reality check, which I think a lot of people in the audiophile world kind of lose that it's like, this is all a luxury. It's all fun. It's all hobby. And I implore that if you can access these things, if you can go to these listening rooms, you should, because it's interesting. It's like anything. It's like going to a restaurant and tasting something that, uh, you know, five different ways that you can, 5,000 different ways you can cook a tomato and diffusions and foams, and maybe you'll have an amazing experience, but you're never going to make tomato foam in your life because you like tomato sauce and they're both equally as good you know before i round out the episode let's go with a few faqs things that people ask me commonly in comments in dms so i can address these so hopefully these will help you on your journey so the first one is what should i listen for when auditioning different components how do i develop my own listening skills my answer to that is just trust yourself do you know what bad sound sounds like? You know what good sound sounds like. I d- very much dispute the fact. A lot of people say to me, I don't know what good sound sounds like. Derek, you can tell me. I don't know. So I don't know what to listen for. I don't know what to listen for is what people say to me often when they're a bit afraid of the hi-fi world and the judgment of that world. I would argue everyone knows what sounds good. If you hear something that just sounds awful, you'll know. I think that and when you hear something amazing, you'll know too. I think where there's diminishing returns is when you have speakers that if you spend $500 on speakers, they're going to sound great to your ears and they are great to your ears. When you are listening to $100,000 speakers and maybe auditioning them in some audiophile room, you will have a different experience with music that you're never going to be around anyway. I've listened to those speakers and they're amazing, but It's not like I'm like, okay, I'm going to save more pennies for that because I want it. It's like, that's crazy. That's so cool. But I'm not going to spend money on that because I I could listen to music on my phone and it'd be just as good as an experience for me as someone that likes the song, not how it's presented all the time. So I think if you have your budget and you have turned on your ears to listen to whether you like it or not, just know what your preferences are. If you have the luxury of trying a few different speakers side by side, which is rare, some might be warmer, some might have more bass, some might be sharper to your ears. One thing to note is that everyone's ears are different and as we get older, our hearing deteriorates. And so you might need sharper sounds because your ears aren't as sensitive anymore. And then a 10 year old, a 20 year old listening to my same sound system will be like, ah, that hurts. And, And that's just, how they hear things it's not even it's not objective it's it's subjective to that person next question what advice would you give someone who is just starting out in the world of hi-fi and looking to build their own system i would say the best thing i would recommend is try to find a friend who might have a speaker or two and listen to theirs and listen to it and maybe know what you like the the speakers that i own i have heard in real life before i bought them Someone might have owned them. Some of them were in an office. Some of them were in a bar. And I was like, I like this. I want that. Let's don't overcomplicate it by trying to look at like different frequency response graphs and reviews saying this is that and this is that. It's helpful to hear them. If you can't, then I do I do implore that you go to a store that sells the brand that you're interested in to hear if you like them and ask them to play the music you want to hear on them. Because uh, Bowers and Wilkins has a very very clear crystal sound that might not be attuned to someone that likes more vintagey type sounds. You might like more like high fidelity type things. So I would recommend trying to hear it with your own ears as much as possible. How do I care for or maintain my hi-fi components to ensure they continue to perform at their best over time? I think it is keeping it very simple. Now, my amplifier that I've had for the last 10, 15 years has been serviced once. Now, I've been told by people, like, you've got to take out your speaker cable every year because there's this charge in it, that the electricity, that da 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 I think there's a lot of kind of old wives' tales within this sort of stuff. I'm sure there's an element of truth to it, but these things last. My dad has had the same 7.1 surround sound system amp plugged in in his house since I can remember, and nothing's happened, nothing's changed. So I would say like with anything, I think they need a service after a while. And if you've been owning it for a while, or maybe you just bought a vintage product and it's bought from someone that hasn't touched it in a while, take it to a shop, take it to a vintage shop. They can replace some of the capacitors. They can replace some of the things just to freshen it up and make sure it's safe to use and make sure that the components are not 
dead inside. But I would say it's they're pretty hardy products. What are the difference between different types of speakers? How their size, shape, and sound characteristics affect their performance? That's a really interesting question. And I think that there's so much to it. The bigger the box usually means the more room and air there is inside to move around the sound in the chambers and in some cases make more of a bass response. It also comes down to the speaker material. It comes down to how the speakers are placed, whether they are within each other, which they call concentric, or whether they are the traditional tweeter or whether they're a horn and things like that. There's so many different types of speaker configurations out there. Kef does it concentric, Klipsch does it horn, JBL does it more in that traditional titanium tweeter and all that sort of stuff. In many ways, the more modern it looks, the more modern it sounds. And by that, I mean, it's crystal clear. It is clean. It is crisp. It is sharp. Things that look a bit chunky and old and fat usually means that it's warmer, more vintage, more attuned to someone that has an ear for listening to more like live recordings or warmer music. But that, they can play everything and anything. So, so don't worry too much about that. How do room acoustics and speaker placements affect the sound? How do I optimize this for my listening experience? This is really hard. And I think that when you get into the audiophile world, it is like a point of contention where you would look at my speakers in any room and someone could say, this is not treated properly, so it's not gonna sound great. And I think that that is untrue. I think that it can always sound better, but unless you're a real, real head that is okay with having sound treatment, and absorption or proofing within your living space, it's never going to be optimal. I, this is just a realist of me that like placement, you can what they call toe them in, angle them, and that does affect the sound a lot because it can make a lot sharper if it's angled directly at your ears or if it's away from your ears or like just straight on, it might spread out the sound more evenly. And different speakers need different things. Some of them need to be pointed to your ears. Some are better at just pointing out to the room. That helps. I would say sound treatment is hard. I think that soft furnishings are always going to help. So if it just sounds a bit boomy and echoey, couches, cushions, curtains are always going to help. You can buy sound absorption material for homes that look okay, but it's a very expensive exercise. And I know that my La Scala is in my living space and not optimal, but they sound lovely to me. So I'm not going to change it right now. What are the different types of vinyl records and how do they affect the sound quality and listening experience and what should I be looking for at purchase? So basically there's different grammage of records. There's 180 grams, which is somewhat of the higher end of vinyl. I think they might even be 240. I could be imagining that. But there's a really, really thin, thin, thin vinyl that Waiting. I don't know what exactly that is. It, it could be even 90 grams, but I, I have a few records from the 70s that are really thin and you shake it and it's floppy. It, could, it would actually flap, you know, whereas 180 grams, it doesn't really do that. It's quite stiff. Most limited edition records these days are 180 gram. I, I would say that if you're buying new records, it, it's ideal to get 180 gram. It, they just last longer uh, and they are higher quality. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, the amount I play my records personally, I don't mind that I've got some really thin ones, but they do wear quicker and they're just more prone to damage. So just keep that in mind. But I would say most modern records are fairly thick these days because I think that's what the consumer expects. I hope I've given you enough information, context, and just given you an approachable way to think about audio. I might have confused you a little bit. I would say to conclude, don't overthink it. Stick to your budget. Look for friends and family that have speakers you can listen to. Go to a store that might have them you can listen to. If you can't, there's always a return policy. And what you're looking for is what do you listen to the most? What do you enjoy? If you enjoy hip hop, a lot of bass, you should be looking for something with good bass or getting a subwoofer. If you are more into classical music, maybe save up for some beautiful, high-end, really crisp, modern speakers to give you that feeling. If you're into movies, look for a surround sound system. If you're looking for something that looks cool, is a bit vintage to go with your record players, 
go for vintage if you don't care about any of that at all just go for the simplest thing possible and don't think about it again and enjoy your music i hope you've enjoyed this episode of Derek g speaks volumes i'm going to send this to everyone that asks me this question ever again and enjoy the rest of your day see you next time